Well, good morning. I'm glad that whether you have chosen in the midst of once again another week we find ourselves in a COVID pandemic being coming into the building or whether you're watching online. I'm grateful that you're choosing to gather as the church. As a country, we find ourselves tomorrow with a day that we have set aside to remember a man. But my hope and my prayer is more importantly, you'll remember that one person, that when they choose to follow the call of God, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself, can make a difference. Whether it's in such a way that you get a, a day named after you, or it's in just such a way that your neighbor realizes there's something different about you. There's a lot of things happening in this world, I think we can all agree, and with Wednesday coming up, maybe there's a lot of concern, a lot of tension. Can, can I encourage you and can I point you over and over to Scripture again and again that hate is too big of a burden to bear? That we need to love like Jesus loves, even if we find it unbelievably hard. All right, I'm going to change gears if I can. I'm excited this morning because we're going to start a brand new series that's going to lead us all the way up to Easter. Easter is the 4th of April this year. So we're going to be in this series for a little bit of time that we've entitled it this, Just Like Jesus. I don't know if you know this or not, but we have a spiritual life team here at our church. I lead it as well with many people on staff. And what we begin to do, is we begin to pray and we ask God, what is it that, that the people who call Christian Fellowship Church their home, whether physically showing up or showing up online during this time, what is it that they need to hear from you, God? God, we want to know and then we want to teach that from your word, specifically in light of something that I've mentioned several times over the last year or two, that Sometime back, we as a community, as a church, we took this survey called Reveal, and we discovered this about us as, an, as a group of people. And this is what we discovered. That we knew a lot about Scripture, but sometimes we failed to do all the things that Scripture calls us to do. That we need to step out a little bit more and be some extroverted people in regards to some areas. And so I'm excited that we're going to look at this series we've entitled Just Like Jesus. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through and study the book of Mark under this series that hopefully will help us right now, but also disciple us into the future. But in order to get the most that we can out of this series, we need to make sure that we all have the same understanding of our commands or the whys in our life. Because if we get that off, we're, we're not going to be able to go in the same place. Now, those of you who know me well, or at least heard me speak over the years, you know that that um, I love 80s music. I, I really do. Some of you, you're fans of the 70s or 60s. Some of you fans of the 90s. Some of you fans of 2000. I, I love 80s music. One of, the, one of the things that I'm proud of is I'm instilling that in my kids. If you ask my 11-year-old who is one of his favorite artists, he will unabashedly tell you Tom Petty. And that makes me proud that he didn't say Justin Bieber, just so you know. I, I, I like it. Now, unfortunately... The truth is, is I probably know thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lyrics to 80s songs. And it's pushed out some scripture I should know better in my life. But that's just kind of where I am from time to time. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Now imagine if we were sitting down over coffee and you knew my passion for that music. You knew I knew all of it. And you asked this question, Brian, why did you begin to listen to that much music? And I told you this. I would say, well, because when I was and pick an age, say eight years old, someone sat down to me and commanded me this, Brian, you need to be a great musician. And you say, well, do you play any instruments? And I'm like, well, my guitar is really bad. My piano is a little bit less than bad, but not, not so much. But I know a lot of 80s songs. You would think of that and say, well, Maybe, just maybe, you misunderstood what was being told to you. And because you misunderstood what was being told to you, how you chose to then move from that moment had some significant impact. Hold that thought right there because I want to ask you a question this morning. And I promise you, I'm not trying to set you up. I promise you I'm not trying to make you feel bad because it's going to seem like a pretty obvious question. That when I ask, have you ever had someone ask you a question, you think, is this a trick question? 
this is going to be one of those questions, but I promise you it's not a trick question. So if you're at home watching and if you're watching on a computer and or you're watching on a handheld where you can respond with like a thumbs up or that sort of stuff, I want you to do it. If you're in this room, I want you to respond to this question. All you got to do is let me see your hand. And, and I promise you, you're like, oh, man. Some of you nervous? Some of you feel nervous right now? Come on, be honest. Some are like, am I in trouble? Or not? Here's the question. Ready? How many of you like Jesus? All right? I'm looking around. We pretty much got 100%. All right? All right? You're like, well, that seems like a really odd question because, I mean, if I didn't like Jesus right now instead of watching you online, Brian, I'd be watching Netflix. Right? If I didn't like Jesus, I wouldn't decide to come into a building in the midst of this and wear a mask and all this. Of course I like Jesus. What's there not to like about Jesus? I mean, clearly, if we understand the gospel, the greatest thing to like about Jesus was that God took upon human flesh. Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a spotless, sinless life, died a sinner's death on that day we call Good Friday, rose again victorious over sin, death, and the grave on Resurrection Sunday so that all of us who would believe can be put back into relationship with God. Because of what Jesus has done, we no longer have to be people who live without hope. That's a pretty good reason to like him, don't you think? That's where the amen should go, by the way, for some of you struggling. Like, are you setting me up for something? Thank you, I got two. Now, it doesn't stop there, though. It, and it would be enough, it was just salvation. I mean, think about all the ways that Jesus is still towards us. He's patient, he serves us, he provides, he loves us. And I like the idea that Jesus is all these things. But if I'm truthful, I'm not always a big fan of having to do those things myself. I mean, I clearly know I can't provide salvation, but there are some things like being patient and serving that sometimes I do better than others. How about you? I mean, as I was even studying Tuesday, it was another one of those days trying to balance all the different things that are different in the world that we now currently live in in 2020 and now in 2021. And, and as I was learning and looking at the section of Scripture we're going to talk about today, I was struggling with serving and, and being patient. And here's what I would like to submit. I would like to submit that there are way too many people who in the analogy before heard be a good musician and thought to themselves, that means I need to learn a lot and listen to a lot of music, has missed what it is that Jesus is actually calling from us. We all like Jesus. However, here it is. It is not enough to like Jesus. We are to be like Jesus. And that's where the rubber hits the road, right? I mean, we, we've gotten a little comfortable just thumbs up to Jesus, right? Social media, we live that way in our life. But don't you think if we misunderstand why behind what we're supposed to do, if we think we're just supposed to like Jesus and not be like Jesus, that's going to have some effect on the what we live out in our life. Maybe, just maybe, that's why we see people who seem to be doing things that Jesus would not necessarily do. But if you ask them, do you like Jesus, they would go, of course I like Jesus. I don't just like Jesus. I love Jesus. If they've misunderstood the command at the beginning, there will be some things later on. So we're going to go through the book of Mark, and we're going to look through these chapters, and we're going to look at how Jesus lives. And then we're going to ask ourselves, are we living like that? And to start this series, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Ephesians. Some of you are like, well, hold on. I've already been moving ahead with my phone or whatever to Mark. You're like, why, why are you starting with Ephesians? Because Ephesians chapter 5, as we're just two verses this morning, is probably the clearest two verses in Scripture that can communicate to us the reality that it's not just enough to like Jesus if we call ourselves Christians, but we're to be like Jesus. It gives us the command behind the why and the what we're supposed to do in life. So as you're getting there, whether you're dialing in, you're looking physical copy, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, he's, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's writing to a church much like us, and he's saying this is how you should live. This is how important it is to live in a way that is not like the Gentiles, which is code is in Ephesians, not like people who don't know Jesus or profess Jesus. People who don't live like people who don't proclaim to be Christ followers. He said, don't let your heart be darkened like that. And then he goes through and he gives a list of ways to live. So much that when he gets now after what he said in chapter 3 and chapter 4 to chapter 5, he makes a sort of transitionary statement 
And he summarizes the why or the command behind the what, what we're supposed to do in our lives. And he does it by giving these eight words at the beginning of verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 5. And this is what it says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. God, we, um, we pause and we recognize that right now in our lives, this might be a moment where we need to examine some things and realize that while we may be good intentioned, we may be misunderstood your call in our life. Maybe today it's going to be a moment that we've understood your call well in your life, but we're, we're just struggling with doing it. Or, or maybe we're, we're doing well, God, in these areas, but we need more strength from you, more help from you to be the people that you've called us to be. God, what it is that your spirit wants to tell us through your word today, we want to receive. But we don't just want to receive it in our heads. We want to live it from our lives. May that be so. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if you've ever been reading a book or something, and while you're reading a book, your, your mind kind of squirrels off to somewhere else. And the next thing you know, you've read a whole page or that sort of thing, and your eyes have gone over it, but you really didn't take in what was being said there. I, I don't want us to do that with here. We really need to take in these words. Therefore, be imitators of Christ. Now, if we break that down into its original language, and again, every once in a while, we talk about the Greek or the Hebrew or that sort of stuff, not to say, hey, look how smart we are, but sometimes in the translation, something is missed to us. And one thing that's often missed when we read this word, therefore, be imitators of Christ, is we miss that in the original language, it's an imperative. What does that mean? It means it's a command. That when we read this, it's not a suggestion. It's not saying if we like it. It's not saying if it's convenient or if we get around to it one day that we're supposed to be imitators of God. It's a command from God through the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, to the church at Ephesus, to us, to live in that way. And you say, well, well what does it mean to imitate? Well, maybe it looks like something different than what I think. It doesn't. That comes from the, the basic language to mimic. So if we put it very Matter of fact, this is what it would say. God commands us to imitate, to mimic his behavior. When we look at our lives and what we do, the why behind what we do, the reason behind everything that we should be doing is this. Not to just like Jesus, but we're commanded to be like Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've discovered in my life, to mimic bad behavior is a whole lot easier than good behavior. Can we agree? This is the time of year where lots of people have decided to change the way that they're eating. I've never once struggled if someone came up and said, Pastor Brian, I want to go on an ice cream diet together. Can you do that with me? I'm in. Throw some hot fudge on that. Maybe some Reese's peanut butter cups, a little peanut butter, chocolate. I'm in. Some of you are like, I am no longer paying attention to what you're saying, Brian. I'm thinking about lunch. That's not hard for me, but... They come up and say, Brian, I want to do this whole 30 thing. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's much harder. It's difficult. We as people who have faults and are broken, it is easier to mimic or imitate negative or hard behavior that is bad than it is to do good things. That's why we hear our kids say things from the back seat that they've never driven a vehicle, but when someone cuts them off in the back seat, they say things like, come on! Because... They've heard the behavior of others. It's hard for them to mimic the good behavior. It's hard for us. And so when we understand that it's much easier because we're broken, fallen people to mimic or imitate bad behavior, when we see this command to graciously live and love like God, it can naturally lead to another question. How is that possible? I mean, this is why I'm supposed to do things, because I'm called to, to imitate God, to be like God. But, I mean, looking at the call to just like Jesus, that I can do. But to be like Jesus, that, that can seem a little overwhelming. Especially when we, we think of all the things that Jesus did and, and how he lived and the fact that he lived a spotless, sinless life. And then we read this and say, to be like that? I don't know, how is that possible? Well, the key there in the first half of 
verse 1 is this, is that as beloved children. You see, our position makes what Jesus and what God is asking us to do possible. The book of Romans tells us that when we come back into relationship with God and we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are adopted into the family of God and we are no longer strangers and enemies of God, but we are now sons and daughters. We have a position as beloved child. And as God's beloved child, listen to this, he's not going to ever call or command or ask us to do something that is impossible. He's not going to say, live a particular way knowing that it can't be done. That, by definition, would not be loving. And we know that God is loving. I mean, imagine if one of your bosses had come to me and said, hey, on Friday, I'm going to let so-and-so go. Unless, unless, on Sunday, they, they came up to the platform and they jumped off the platform and had the ability to go through the camera and land on the couch of someone who's watching right now. First off, if that was possible, a whole lot of people who are watching right now would be wondering, are pajamas appropriate for the people who are about to come into my room? But you and I both know that's not possible. So it would seem really unfair if your boss said, you're going to lose your job unless you do the impossible. That would not be loving. When we think about the way that Jesus lived, when we think about how he functioned amidst of all kinds of challenges and difficulty, we many times think it's just as impossible as what I just explained. And if we misunderstand the key about how it's supposed to happen and be able to do what God wants us to do, yes, it will be impossible. But the key to being able to do it is because we are God's children, and as being God's children, we have Christ in us. That's the how. If you've been at church any amount of time, you heard me talk about this before, that when we come into a relationship with God, what occurs then is that God puts his very spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, to guide, to direct us, and empower us. And another one of them, uh, Paul's books that he wrote while he was in prison. He wrote Ephesians while he was in prison, somewhere between 80, 60 to 62. He wrote another book called Philippians. And there's this verse in Philippians chapter 4 that really gets at the how behind this challenging thing that God is asking us to do, to live like him. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Those are the words. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Again, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, I saw a mug the other day that made me laugh that took a riff off this verse that said this. I can do everything through a verse I take out of context. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 is one of the most misused words or sections of Scripture because they don't understand the context. Listen, if that applied to every single moment in every context that the impossible could happen, I submit to you that the Browns would make the Super Bowl. Because nobody in this room has prayed more about that than me and my family. I can tell you that. But they haven't. So does that mean God's lied? No, it means we have to understand the context. The context of Philippians 4, the context of Ephesians is still very much the same. He's talking about the life that he's called us to live. Back up before Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 3. He's talking about all these things that we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live. And he says it's possible through Christ who gives us strength. Here's the truth. God gives us who we need to do the what we cannot do on our own. The what is to be like Jesus, to live like Jesus. But he gives us who, his spirit in us, to do it because we can't do it on our own. Implicit in the call to be like Jesus, to be like God, not just to like him, but to be like him, is this call to surrender. Is this call to let him work in us. And so that when we see that we're supposed to imitate God, it cannot be based upon the wrong influence in our life because if we try to do the right thing from the wrong influence, we're going to have the wrong outcome. Imagine that my son decides now he wants to play the guitar. And he knows, he knows this for a fact, that his father has an encyclopedic sort of knowledge of 1980s hairband power ballads. And he knows that, that 
his dad at any point can hum, sing, or air a guitar. Heading for a heartbreak, 1988 winger, guitar solo in the middle of it. He goes, oh, I should go talk to him about learning to play the guitar. And he comes up to me and says, dad, I want you to teach me how to play the guitar. And I'm like, I can hum it for you. I can even play a mean air guitar for you. I can tell you when the song was written and who sung it. I can tell you who was playing it at the time. But he goes, but can you teach me how to do it? I would go, no. And then if he said, well, I'm never going to learn the guitar, you would say, well, the problem isn't that you can't learn the guitar. The problem is you went to the wrong place to get influence. If you want to learn how to get, learn the guitar, ask Pastor Shane who's playing, or ask Tristan who's one of our guitarists here. Ask them how to play. Don't ask me. I can tell you about the guitar. I just can't tell you how to do it. If we are under the right influence, we can do the right what that we're called to do. But if we're not under the right influence, we can't. And I think it's many times there are two reasons that the, the culture in the world often look at those of us who carry the name Christ follower and they feel that we're inconsistent. Or maybe, put another word, hypocritical. And we are. I'm not saying we try to be. I'm just saying from time to time, sometimes more than not, we are inconsistent. We are hypocritical. But there are two things I want us to miss, uh, not miss, especially when the world is watching. The first is this. One of the reasons that many times people look at Christ followers... And they're like, I don't want anything to do with that. And make the determination that that really isn't about God. Is that they're looking at people who claim to be Christ followers. But really aren't. The source of the hypocrisy actually is they're, they're not being inconsistent. They're carrying the name of Jesus. But they really don't follow Jesus. Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus' most famous section of Scripture that he taught. When he gets to chapter 7, he's talking about a lot of things, but one that every time I read it stops me in my tracks. Concerns me at my core. Is he addresses this very thing when he says this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20 and 21, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those at who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. You know what I'm saying? Not enough just to like Jesus. They're really to find out if we're, we're true followers, if we're really that. It will show up in what we do in our lives. And, and, and it has to be a moment for all of us in the midst of so much that we're happening in our culture right now to stop and evaluate and say this. Are people just claiming Lord, Lord, or are they living in a way that's consistent with what they claim? Now, even if there are groups of people like that, and, and there are, there, there's also many people who are Christ followers. Now, I'm going to assume that you are. I, I know that I am. That we still mess it up from time to time. Can we agree? I, I don't wake up in the morning thinking, hey, you know what my goal today is? Really mess up this Christianity thing. You know, I, you don't. If you woke up this morning with that thought, you would have never came into the building. You would never be watching online. That's not my thought. Yet I think many times in my life, and, and maybe it's the same with yours, that I begin to act in a way that is not a good reflection of Jesus when I become overwhelmed. And when I become overwhelmed with things, whether it's things I see happening or things I need to get done, and in that moment of being overwhelmed, I make a choice. And here's the choice. I choose my strength and my flesh and my will to power what God is asking me to do instead of Christ in me who's supposed to power what I'm supposed to do. And when I do that, when you do that, 
it is highly likely, if not most likely probable, that we will wind up living an inconsistent life. We will like Jesus, but not be like Jesus. Here's the truth. Choosing the wrong how. Not choosing the Holy Spirit's power, Christ's power, but my own power or anyone else's power will always lead to the inability to do the right what? In times of challenge, there's this prayer that I need to pray more. There's this prayer that we all need to pray more that goes like this. Jesus, help me be more like you. Not just like you, wear the jersey, carry the Bible, but actually be like you. I I need your help, Jesus. Because you've given me a command to, to, to be like you. And you said it's possible through your strength. And, and as we walk down this understanding and saying, look, before we get into the book of Mark, we said, okay, we got to be all on the same page. The, the why we do what we do is we're commanded to be like Jesus. How? Through his power. That then leads to the next question. Okay, when I examine my life and the things I'm supposed to do, when we look at the book of Mark, when we look at what we see here in the book of Ephesians, what am I supposed to do? What does that actually look like? Because I don't know about you, but there's been times where I feel called to do something by a pastor, and they said, go and do it. But they've been really unhelpful in painting a picture of what it might look like. So I want to paint a picture. And the good news is I don't have to paint the picture. The Holy Spirit paints it for us really, really well in verse 2. This is what it says. What does it look like when we imitate Jesus and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Simply put, the best way to mimic or imitate God is to actually love like Jesus. Think about it. How much Jesus loves us. Jesus dying on the cross was the ultimate demonstration of love. If we go back to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell, and we look at what happens at that moment where Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the world, and we've all taken part of that sin which now separates us from God. The reflex action of God from one of the very beginning things we understand of history was this. Instead of being selfish, he was selfless. Instead of running away from the difficulty, he ran towards the cross in self-sacrifice. My reflex reaction has not gotten to the point yet where it needs to be in the midst of difficulty and challenge and hurt and pain to run towards the self-sacrificial life of love. Instead, I run to all kinds of things. I may hole up and hide from people. Saying, well, if you can't get near me, you can't hurt me. Or I may feel justified in what I do. The game of whataboutism is going around a lot in Christianity today. I go back to last week. We can't do something ungodly for a godly reason and expect godly blessing. And so maybe we act in a particular way towards a group of people or a person. And and in that moment, when I choose not to actually live and love the way that Jesus wants to, I will be choosing the wrong what. Believe us or not, it is still okay to ask the age-old question, what would Jesus do? We don't need the bracelet anymore. We never did. And when we ask this question, if the answer to that question doesn't line up to the answer that we want or what we're actually doing at that moment, we need to change. And the reason that we can change in that moment is because we have the Spirit in us and the love that Jesus has for us should then be able to motivate us living in a loving way towards other people. And we cannot miss this. As we look at the book of Mark coming up, as we understand this call to love like Jesus, it will mean at some point we are going to have to do some hard, difficult things that require sacrifice. Many weeks back, I don't remember how how long it is. Some of you might remember, some of you might not. I talked about the triangle of behavior. And I had everyone at home and I had everyone in the room do this. And I, I want to do it again for us this morning. If you have your hands, I want you to go like this. I want you to go like this. Put them out. If you're at home, I can't see you, but I'm trusting you. You're doing it, right? Okay. If you imagine at the top of that triangle is God and on one side is you and on the other side is that person that's driving you crazy. 
When we understand what it means to live like Jesus, that means this, that every action we do for that person actually is first for Jesus. And then they are the recipient of that love on behalf of Jesus. Because here's the thing. If I don't live that way, like what I do for the other person is first for God because he's sacrificed for me. If I don't live that way, Cindy, I tell you, there's no possible way I'm going to be able to imitate God's behavior. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's my wife. I don't care if it's the best person I can think of on the planet. If I do something for them and it's not for God first, when they don't respond in a way that makes me feel loved. When I think I'm saying something well and I get the email telling me I didn't do it really well. When I think I said something or did something where a purpose of caring, but someone doesn't respond to me well. If it's just for them and not for God, I will never be the person who is an imitator of God. Because my motivation will come from someplace other than Jesus' love for me. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. I'm going to tell you, there are going to be times if we choose to do what he asks, we're going to have to give ourselves up. And if we think it's for this other person we're missing it, we're actually giving ourselves up for Jesus. And when I don't do this, when I'm not influenced by the Holy Spirit, I will be influenced by myself. And the result is I will settle for liking Jesus, but not being like Jesus. I think all of us have to ask this question when we, when we look at our lives. Where is it in, in that part of our life where we're not being selfish, selfless enough, we're being more selfish than selfless? And friends, I, I believe that the church... Our church, the, the church universal, right? We're struggling. We're struggling because too often we've, we've misunderstood the why behind the what of our actions. We heard something and we thought the command was to be like Jesus. And we're all like, yeah, I like Jesus. And we should. But liking Jesus isn't enough. The command isn't to like Jesus for my life or your life. The command is to be like Jesus. Now that, that's a much harder thing. But can you imagine? Can you imagine what would happen in Ashburn? Can you imagine what would happen in Loudoun County? Can you imagine what happened in Northern Virginia, Virginia, the United States, and the world? Could you imagine what would happen if a group of people who called themselves Christ followers lived in a way that they loved and acted as imitators of God, as dearly beloved children in the power of the Holy Spirit? My guess is that's what Jesus wanted when he prayed, my kingdom come. My guess is that's really what we want when we think about this idea that God help us make a difference in the world. He said, if we want to make a difference, it's not just enough to like him. We've got to choose to be like him. And as we lead up to Easter, we're going to look at Jesus' life in the book of Mark. But we had to start here at Ephesians 5 to not miss. So we didn't understand what the command was. We're going to see how we live. We're going to look at things. We're going, to, we're going to make the decision with the power of the Holy Spirit. Will I imitate him in ways of being patient and serving, providing, submitting, and sacrifice, and walking in peace? There's going to be all kinds of opportunities to respond to those things. But for now, for today, I have a few questions. And here's the first one. How would you describe yourself? Liking Jesus or being like Jesus? I've struggled with that question this week. Asking this question, am I lying to myself? Am I just telling myself what I want to hear so I don't have to change my behavior? Am I just telling myself what I want to hear because it would be kind of embarrassing to say that my calling in life is to be a pastor, but I settled for this when he wanted more. If you are struggling with that question and you don't know, I'm going to ask you to pray about that this week. And I'm going to ask you to do something that requires maybe a level of vulnerability you don't feel comfortable with, but I believe it will be unbelievably helpful. 
I want you to find someone in your life that you trust their walk with God and you trust that they will speak in love to you, but honestly. Sit down on a Zoom call. Maybe someone lives in the same house. Sit down over coffee. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe something of that nature. Sit down and just ask this question. Hey, when you look at my life, be honest. Be kind. Be honest. Would you say I like Jesus more than I'm being like Jesus? And, and make a commitment no matter what comes back to you. To say, okay, Jesus, if the answer wasn't what I liked, instead of using this moment to shame myself and beat myself up, but may this be a call in my life to change through the power of the Spirit. Here's the second thing. Maybe you know you're supposed to be like Jesus. Maybe I know I'm supposed to be like Jesus, but there are some places in your life that when you just rub up against those places, our natural tendency is to have our power or our flesh try to power us instead of Christ. Maybe it's loving someone, being patient, serving, providing Submitting to someone, sacrificing, walking in peace. Here's the third thing. Maybe today I know there's a place in my life that I have been much more selfish than selfless, and I need to sacrifice. If there's a place like that in your life, today the opportunity is to respond. You know, I like Jesus. You do too. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be watching. But may none of us settle by saying that what Jesus really wants from us is this. When what he really wants is to be like him. God, We've listened to your word. We understand that we fall short in many ways, but your grace is big and sufficient. And so today, for you have revealed in our hearts, in our actions, in our ways where we maybe have been misunderstanding the call. Or maybe we understand the call really well, but have been making some poor decisions, God. I, I pray that you begin to do a work in our hearts. And we take the promise that you who began a good work will be faithful to complete it in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Would you please stand and take some moment in your own heart to reflect on these questions. Consider what's being sang over you or sing with them.